Dr. Casey Olson. I'm with the Department of Animal Sciences and Industry at Kansas State University. Better nickname for Cerisia lespediza is to call it a feral hog. Now, just to give you an idea of, of how dramatic that biodiversity loss can be, we did a, a short study. Fish and Wildlife Foundation uh, with a research idea that was that was pretty it was pretty far fetched at the time. We thought, okay, that we could um, change our approach to prescribe fire a little bit, and we could potentially uh, make some headway against Cerisia lespediza. So we did a four year study that actually began in. 2014 and ran through 2017 where we moved uh, prescribed fire from early spring to either midsummer or late summer. Uh, we thought that these fire regimes would be compatible with um, the favored stalker cattle grazing systems here in the Flint Hills. Uh, and we thought, okay, by applying prescribed fire at either the flowering stage of Cerisia lespediza development or the stage immediately preceding seed production, okay, that we could potentially hurt the plant. Uh, and we could give our native plants, okay, that are conditioned to accept fire in any month of the year, we could potentially give our native plants uh, a competitive advantage over Cerisia. So with the early spring fire being our positive control, okay, in a lot of years we had something like this, okay, in the month of April. Um, you know, with uh, dry fuel conditions and, and uh, um, low humidity, we created some pretty big flames. Fortunately, we were able to, uh, to control our spring fires in most cases. Okay, the, the little fella there in the picture, uh, that's me, and I'm, I'm not praying, but I probably should be. I'm a good 100 feet off of that head fire line right there, and, and my face is up to my hand because the heat is so intense. Okay, that sort of illustrates the the, the risky nature of um, prescribed fire in the spring. Now the aftermath of prescribed fire, the, I think the ranching community tip, typically looks forward to. Every every piece of vegetation gets gets removed and the whole system reboots. Okay, we're used to seeing that, that slick, black, clean slate, if you want to think about it that way, after a typical uh, spring fire. Okay, next, I want to show you something a little different. Sorry for the noise, but this is a fire that was conducted in early August of 2016. Uh, on a day when wind speeds were about uh, 12 to 15 miles an hour. It wasn't a very good day actually for a prescribed fire. But uh, you can see as the fire moves through there's a lot of standing green material that's uh, left behind. Um, because what's actually burning is the layer of litter, the, the layer of dead plant material at the soil surface. And those flames, even though I'm standing right in the head fire, those flames are very subdued, um, not uncomfortable to be close to, uh, and that noise, that popping and crackling that you can hear, okay, that is, um, that is water being volatilized from those living plants. Okay, this next short video is, is uh, typical of, a, of an early September prescribed fire. Okay, and the, the loud cracking and popping that you could hear in that video clip is the sound of Cerisia lespediza dying. What happens when the fire con contacts the plant crown of a mature Cerisia lespediza plant and volatilizes all the water in that plant crown, there's, a, there's like a miniature explosion and the, uh, the aerial 
or sorry, I should say the basal portion of the plant uh, almost blows apart. Now, the aftermath of a summer fire is a little bit different than my rancher friends are used to seeing. On the day of a fire, this would be the left panel, okay, there's still a lot of standing green material uh, right after the fire has passed through. But if you come back in 24 to 48 hours, you get a picture that looks more like the right-hand panel, where even though there is standing vegetation, even though the plant crowns are still present in the soil, uh, the system has still been rebooted. Okay, it's it's gonna it's gonna reinitiate growth late in the growing season, and uh, and 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 give us just a little bit of a different look. So the first question you should be asking yourself is, okay, what does this new approach to fire do to Cerisia lespidiza that today has degraded about 900,000 acres? Of grazing lands in the in the Kansas Flint Hills. Okay, sorry, I'm a academic geek. I love graphs. I love tables. So bear with me. Um, so this is what happened after four years of prescribed fire in either early spring, midsummer, or late summer. Okay, early spring in the gray, midsummer in the purple, and late summer in the white. And that'll stay that way throughout. Okay, basal cover is really a, a measure of plant populations of all of the plant crowns that are at the, the soil surface. Okay, how many of those, okay, if the total is 100%, how many of the, of the 100% are Cerisia lespidiza individuals? Well, under an early spring fire regime, that number was about 7.5%. That is a serious uh, an economically damaging infestation. Okay, when we moved our prescribed fire timing to early August, okay, that number was substantially less. It was less than half at about 3.4% um, okay, of all plant crowns. When we moved our fire to early September, okay, that number became less than 2%, about 1.7% of all the plant crowns were identified as Cerisia lespidiza. Okay, all that changed in this scenario is the timing of fire. That is it. And let me tell you folks, okay, when your Cerisia lespidiza problem uh, is less than about 4% of all plant crowns, it becomes difficult to see. It becomes difficult to find. It becomes a much less visible member of the plant community. Okay, another way that we can assess the um, maybe the canopy dominance of Cerisia lespidiza was something called aerial frequency. Basically, we put a, a 12 inch by 12 inch metal frame on the ground. We look inside that frame from above and we, and we decide, okay, is there a Cerisia lespidiza plant in here uh, or not? Okay, and this gives us an idea about how much canopy space that um, Cerisia lespidiza is occupying. Well, in an early spring fire regime, okay, the number of those plots that had at least one Cerisia crown in them, okay, was about 55%. It was bad. Okay, when we moved our fire timing to early August, okay, we dropped that number by about half, down to about 30%. When we moved our fire uh, to early September, okay, we dro dropped that number by about two-thirds, less than 20% of... Uh, those frames had a Cerisia lespidiza plant in them. Okay, so not only was it becoming less numerous, okay, the ones, the individuals that were left behind were becoming less canopy dominant and capable of robbing photosynthesis uh, from other plants, from native plants. Okay, at the end of every season, we clipped 100 stems from uh, each transect uh, on each treatment. Uh, and we dried those stems. These are Cerisia stems now. We dried those stems out and we weighed them. Okay, in, a, in an early spring situation, um, the average Cerisia stem weighed just under 4,000 milligrams. Okay, in an early August fire regime, the average stem weighed about uh, 350 milligrams. And the uh, average stem in a early September fire regime weighed uh, about 100 milligrams. So 
we uh, we made it less numerous we made it less canopy dominant and we made the surviving individuals much much smaller okay last piece of Cerecia lespedeza data okay when Cerecia lespedeza invades locally it does it off of its own root system because it's a perennial plant but when Cerecia lespedeza invades regionally okay it requires something usually a human being or a human operated piece of machinery to transport viable seed uh, to a new location and so that's why controlling seed production uh, of this plant is so critical well under an early spring or mid spring rather fire regime the average Cerecia lespedeza stem produced 711 seeds per plant okay in a midsummer fire regime that was less than 30 seeds per stem and in a late summer fire regime you can see that number is really tiny it's not zero okay but it is close to zero that is uh, an average of 0.3 at 0.3 seeds per stem per year and, and keep in mind that this is over four years and just so you know I'm not making this up and it's not just esoteric I want to show you some pictures okay in little bags we took all of the seed that we harvested from 100 stems uh, and and we counted those seeds and weighed them or I guess we weighed them and then we counted them but this is 2014 the first year of this of uh, the study um, on the far left okay our seeds harvested from a spring burn area in the middle seeds harvested from 100 stems the same number in a uh, August burn fire regime and on the far right okay all the seeds produced by 100 stems uh, in a late summer uh, or early September burn regime so that was year one okay with one year treatment this is year two this is year three and this is year four okay every year that we applied fire we did this every year for four consecutive years every year that we applied fire okay we um, significantly dented the ability of Cerisi lespedeza to reproduce by seed and over time okay we were able to work on those adult plants and those those seedlings uh, and progressively weaken them to the point where they become or they became rather uh, just another plant component in the ecosystem we had successfully okay taken away the competitive advantage of that plant so how did it happen I thank you for hanging with me again my name is Casey Olson I'm with animal sciences and industry at Kansas State University I'm easy to find on the World Wide Web if you have any questions comments or ideas uh, I would really really appreciate hearing from you uh, God bless stay safe out there during this um, very strange unprecedented time in, in American history um, my thoughts are with you